Okay, uh, last talk before lunch. Uh, Jackie O'Brien uh, works for, uh, with Energene Diagnostics, and Jackie's going to tell us about NHS clinical pathway and stakeholder involvement. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm short as well, so I'll cut this down a little bit. Thank you um, for allowing me to be here today. Um, the, 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 the approach that we're taking in, in well, uh, what, the way I'm speaking about this is a slightly different position. Um, we're standing with the shoes of the clinician um, and looking at the clinical pathway in the way that the clinical pathway is implemented in the NHS. So um, I need to start clicking slides, don't I? <laughs> Um, to introduce the Inigene, Inigene is a pharmacogenetics company um, based in Canada, um, which is a research-based company. Um, the, uh, the, the, the focus of the business has predominantly been on, stay still, predominantly been in mental health and pain. Um, and the panel that has been developed by Dr. Kathy Zeminovich and uh, Ben Pinder has um, been now extended to other areas. But for the purpose of this project, we've been looking at pain and mental health patients in the NHS. Our partners within the um, project that we've been working with is most definitely the NHS. Um, all the way through, everything that we have done has been in joint decision-making process with um, Birmingham Women's Children's Hospital. Our project lead there is a pharmacist who is chief pharmacist for Birmingham Women's and Children's and supported us through the process. We've got Central and South Genomics Laboratory, which is the host, uh, or, well, no, is, is part of uh, West Midlands Regional Genetics Labs. Um, and um, I will put my hand up and say I'm not a clinical scientist, so if anybody's got any complex clinical scientific questions, I'm going to point you at Jess. Sorry, Jess, I should have asked you earlier, who's actually her team's running the samples through the laboratory. And then we have Forward Thinking Birmingham, who is the mental health service within um, the West Midlands that is actually bringing the patients through this system and um, putting them into the pilot. So a little bit about Inigene's personal in personalised insights. This is a, as I already said, pain and mental health panel. It's a very simple format. Um, we have a, a front end, which is a simple rag rating with red, amber, green rating. So you have red is, is, is defined as do not use with a guidance there. You've got the green, which is as it would be prescribed in the BNF or by drug um, um, manufacturer. And then the, the amber is used with caution. So all the information that is within the report is taken from um, well-known consortia like CPIC, PharmGKB, um, DPWG, the, the, the places where you would normally go for information already. And with that information, we've then just pulled it together into a single place, and you have this RAG-rated report. The amber section is very much... Um, there for clinical decision making, where you have a, um, a, a variant which is indicating a, a reason why the clinician should stop and think and look at the medications that the patient's prescribing. And in everything we do with the training that we do with the rollout for the clinicians, we do that in a way that um, we're bringing them through to look at pharmacogenetics as a medical device, as something that is there as an additional tool. It's not the be-all and end-all. It's not going to give them the ultimate answer to the, the result for the patient. It's something that is integrated into their normal clinical practice. So they should be looking at nice guidelines. They should be looking at the patient's presentation. They should be looking at the medical history and the results that, that they would normally do then use this as an extra part of the jigsaw puzzle and bring it into the pathway. So that's just a little bit of information about the, the tool itself. So, <clears throat> building an end-to-end -end service. We sort of, again, like I said, we've looked at this from a slightly different approach in that within the NHS there is quite a tremendous um, sort of mental health service crisis. Um, locally, the teams are working at over 180% of capacity. Um, we've got over 1.6 million patients waiting to access secondary care services. And with COVID as well, adding to that additional burden, then it's most definitely a well-defined, unmet clinical need. So we brought together the team into the room. And the team, as I've already described, is the, um, the medical team from Forward Thinking Birmingham and the pharmacist team from um, Birmingham Women's and Children's Hospital. And then also the laboratory team, from um, West Midlands Regional Genetics Labs. And doing that, it's almost like the, how do we implement things from the ground up? How can we, what if we could use this tool, and it is very much a what if, we don't know the absolutes, what if we could use this tool to um, 
reduce the capacity overload by helping the patient get to their medication, their optimal treatment, as a medicines optimization project, if they could get to their optimal medication early within the pathway, which ultimately will reduce the impact of number of repeat visits to see the clinician, which ultimately will then release some of the capacity for the clinicians. So this is the conversations that we sat down and started to have. And with everything that we've done, the patient is the centre of that discussion. And I must admit, I've got a personal vested interest. Do you mind if I just grab my water? My mouth's getting busy. Sorry about that. Mm, that's better. My mouth is beginning to stick to itself. So I have a personal vested interest in that I actually have an adult daughter with mental health problems who's on over 25 medications. So the thought of actually having something built into the NHS structure that can rationalise, deprescribe, help deprescribing as much as it can help focus on the right medication for somebody that's struggling with those sorts of issues is actually quite personal to me. So putting the patient at the centre of the conversation is really, really critical. So how have we sort of built the patient flow? And again, we've sort of taken a relatively simplistic approach as to how does the NHS normally carry a patient through the clinical pathway. So the medical team identify the patient, they will take the consent and take the sample. We've looked at the type of sample we needed to take, and on the basis that these are mental health patients, rather than go for blood tests, we're going for oral swab, because a mental health patient who's under distress isn't going to want to have a blood sample taken. Um, and then also we've got a sponges rather than a normal swab, because the sponge has been for somebody with dry mouth, a little, <laughs> a little bit like I'm struggling with at the minute. Um, then um, moving on to the process, once the sample's been taken, we've mapped it through to the, um, where does it go with the laboratory. Um, the, the team in the lab will extract, extract the sample and upload the results into the back end of the Inogene software, so into the Inogene lab software, which then generates the report within a few, few sort of minutes. And then that is then linked back through to the front end of the portal where the clinician gets a notification to review the data um, in advance of the patient appointment. And at that point, we bring the patient back into the room and the clinician will sit down with the patient, explain their results, and do a medication review with them. So, as with everything, that was relatively simple. We thought it was great and we thought it would be fairly straightforward. But when you start to get into the detail of mapping out the patient journey, Everything gets more complicated. Where do you put in the consent request? How does it all fit together? How do you get the sample from um, the, the, the patient, where the patient is in the community, back to the lab? And all of these types of things. How do we get the clinicians to actually create their accounts um, to have their software account where we can make sure they can access the information? And then also, how do we bring in the MDT structure within that to um, make sure that the pharmacist helps review the information before the clinician actually sees the patient. So all of these things we've tried to think through, we've built in, we've changed some things already in that where we actually speak to the patient is a slightly different place than we anticipated. We thought initially when the patient goes in to see the consultant that they would be quite happy to sit with their mental health consultant and, and have that conversation and do the consent and agree to have their sample. Reality of it is, a patient in, in, in that position, they've been waiting so long for their appointment to actually get through the door to talk to their consultant about what they need to talk about, this is the last thing on their agenda. Yes, they want the best medication, but they don't really want to talk about DNA, and it's, it's a bit of a, an, an anxious moment. So we've taken that back two steps to where the patient has their mental health physical check, and during that clinic, when they're in a less stressed situation, they're with a junior doctor, they're not with a consultant, they will have that conversation under the supervision of the consultant um, to then bring it in so that the patient understands it a little bit better and, and bring it through. So that is the theory. And then how do we actually implement a software medical device and bring that software medical device into an NHS clinical pathway? And it's great thinking, we have this solution, we, we need to be trying it, what can it look like, what if, can we make it work? But then you actually look at the reality of implementation. 
And with that, we've got the, the, the clinical section where we've already sort of mentioned that, that we bring the clinical team together, but we have to go through the drugs and therapeutics, the ethics committee, the genetic counsellors, the research and academic teams. So we've worked with all of these guys. Then from the laboratory perspective, that has been an interesting journey, although Jess will now say to me that the, the, the lab work is the easy bit, the rest of understanding the clinical pathway is more complex. That's because she's the clinical scientist. She knows more about that than me. But to get us from A to B to actually where we are now, we've had to go through quality assurance. We've had to go through legal. We've gone through IT governance. The, um, where does the data sit? Is it secure? Are we GDPR compliant? Um, have we gone through MHRA? What are we doing with all of our quality control systems? Um, and then also with the business and finance sections as well. So it's, it, what could seem like a, we have a product, do you want to buy it? Isn't that simple. It's, it's a, a long, complex process, and we've been working on this now for two years with them. Then beyond that, we have got other partners that we have been, been in, in, in engaging throughout the process, and that we've, I was really pleased to see the MHRA team on the, on the, on the call this morning, um, because going through the process of, of, of UK CA accreditation or CE accreditation, ensuring that this is put in place, that you have a compliant uh, medical device that you are able to bring to market in the UK, um, we've worked alongside the GMSA, who have been very supportive in what we've been doing. Then NS NHS Digital, we've had to go through the DPIA process to ensure that we've got the data protection agreement in place. And then also looking at how we now work towards working with Education England. And again, all the way through all of this, everything we've done, can I go back one, has been to check that we are actually in line with what we're going to need for the outputs for the patient. Mm. So this brings me to my last slide. So I hopefully might have caught some time up for you, Munir. Um, everything that we've done is trying to take a patient-centric approach. Um, within the process, we have engaged patient user groups. These are the patients that would sit within the, clinic, the, the clinical service. They've been able to have a voice on how they would like to see things work, what materials we would put in place. Um, are those materials correct? How would they like it to be done? And we've, we've already changed how we would bring them into the, the clinical pathway based on their feedback. Um, the diversity and inclusion, the panel itself um, that is being run by West Midland Genetics Lab ensures that it goes to the depth to pick up the ethnicity as is required for the multi mixed, highly mixed population within the West Midlands. Then we're looking at the core 20 plus criteria and reducing health inequalities, ensuring that anybody within that type of population will be able to access the information and results. And the accessing information and results is very much in partnership with their healthcare professional. So at the very beginning, they're involved in the conversation as to why we're taking a sample and looking at their medication. But then at the end, the consultant will sit down with the patient, having had that MDT discussion with the pharmacist, and actually look to say, okay, what is it that you've been telling me all this time about your medication and why it's been failing? Can we explain some of that with your results? And from that, can we look to see what now we can do that we'll put in instead because we wanted to change your medication anyway, and that is why we're doing this sample in the first place. And then beyond that as well, um, you, you look at the patient, you've got the complexities of languages. And, and so we're working out how to build in the patient materials and um, the different types of things that we will need to plan for the future, including um, the, the Hindu Gujarati Punjabi that is going to be, so quite, again, quite critical to the mix of patients that we have. Um, ultimately, we, we, we don't know if this is going to be the, the, the absolute way that this should be run. We don't know that. And we know that whatever it is the NHS wants, we're going to have to evolve the software and develop it as we go through this process. This is a learning process. It's a pilot project looking at using pharmacodynamics in a mental health clinical pathway to see if we can support the patients get their optimal medication sooner. But we've got a while to go. We, we've got a lot of development to go, including looking at how everything integrates into the, into the patient pathway, sorry, into the patient records. Um, but um, I think we've got a good start. So I'm gonna stop there. And you can ask any questions. Thank you very much. I'll let you have some water. Thank you. Yeah. So, any questions? It's John first. Thanks very much. Um, so, I'm just wondering 
where's the data stored as part of this project? And um, might be a question for Jess, but um, what platform are you using for the, for the testing? Jess, do you want to pick up on the, on the testing? Okay. Um, and the data's stored in the UK, but yeah, I'll let um, Jackie do the rest of it. <laughs> so, so just to, re to re repeat what Jess said, so we're using a mass array um, as a processor, um, and then the data is stored in the UK. So the, the software itself is a web-based tool, so it can be accessed from any point, but the actual repository is based in the UK, so it's within GDPR compliance and ensuring that we meet those regulations. Hi. Um, are, are you advanced enough to get any information on or, or seeing the results in terms of patient outcomes and their experience? So we're not that advanced yet. We've we started the pilot. We've got patients coming through. We're going to be running it through for 100 patients initially just to test the system um, and, and fine-tune everything how we want it to look. Um, we are, we've got a whole series of metrics, including patient outcomes, to measure and follow up, and as we get that data, we will keep everybody in the loop. So, can I just ask about the pilot that you're undertaking at the moment? Are those patients on just single uh, mental health drugs, you know, so one antidepressant or one antipsychotic, or do you have the more complex patients who are in multiple drugs and you, you describe one particular individual? Absolutely. I, th I think it's a difficult... A difficult question because we've had quite a lot of conversation with the consultants as to who and the when and the how. And we've ended up coming back, especially with, with the, the request of the, um, the medical director from FTB, is that where there is a patient who needs a medication review, that is when they are offered the test. So whether it is a patient who is a chronic patient and has had a lot of medication over the years, um, and um, th you want to explain their failures, okay. then they've got that. But similarly, if it's somebody you're looking at sort of for a new patient coming into the system, then they, they should have equal access. Um, the only point that I would actually make, the, the, the pilot project itself is in secondary care. So we're obviously working towards rolling it out to primary care and the access for the GPs, because the report is simple enough to be able to train them in to do that. But at the moment, it's a secondary care project, but that means that the patients will have already gone through a, a series of medications by the time they reach the consultants in secondary care. So even a new patient coming into the system will have had medications. Okay, okay. Thank you very much. I don't see any more hands up, so I think, uh, uh, thank you very much, Jeff. Thank you. So let's just thank all the speakers from this morning, so thank you very much. So it's a time, time for lunch now, uh, and uh, I think lunch is just out there. And, and is it, what time do we get back? One o'clock? Yeah, one o'clock. Thank you.